Hi, this is your host, Sokhan Bharti, and we're back to our popular prediction video series. And today we have with us once again, Hilary Carter, SVP of Research and Communications at the Linux Foundation. Hilary, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you, Swap. It's great to be back again. Of course, we are going to talk about your predictions. But before we go there, I would like to talk a bit about the Linux Foundation. The world has changed a lot around us. We kind of live in a software-driven, open-source-centric world. Talk a bit about the role of Linux Foundation in this world. Yeah, thank you. The world has changed. If we look back to where we were at the beginning of 2023, uh, it's it's a new, um, it's a it's a different kind of world. We have a lot of uncertainty. We have increasingly high interest rates. We have a new conflict in the Middle East. We have su- supply chain disruptions in the Red Sea resulting from that conflict ongoing war in Ukraine, it is a very uncertain time. And it has it has it has been challenging for uh, the ecosystem. Um, And open source is is no exception. Our members face challenges, um, our our politicians face challenges. And what we can do is is be a resource to try to help solve some of these challenges. Uh, But it is a challenging world we live in today. And if you look at some of these challenges, whether it's regulations like CRAs or companies changing licensing terms, uh, and to which uh, Linux Foundation and the community responded with Open Tofu, talk a bit about in general. What do you see? Are is 2024 going to get better for open source, or there will be new challenges? In general, what do you see? Where are we heading in terms of open source in 2024? I think some of the challenges that we went through in 2023 are uh, net beneficial to open source for 2024. You mentioned the open tofu example, and I think what we were able to convey in that process of of creating open tofu is disseminating the value proposition around open governance and license considerations that that trusted technologies um, are often found where governance is truly open. And that has helped decision making. I think that's been an important clarification uh, that can help um, uh, accelerate innovation, that we know more about what the risks are when when, um, open technologies are not truly openly governed and Uh, I think we're in a better place today, having come through those challenges of last year. Similarly, uh, generative AI exploded onto the scene in December of 2022. And throughout the year, we have had, um, I think, accelerating points of view around the benefits of open, uh, certainly open generative AI, open source uh, language models that create trust. And I think those are those were important conversations that needed uh, to take place. And I think the the sentiment is moving in the favor of open uh, where generative AI is concerned. I think that's really positive. That's really exciting. So I think we're full steam ahead based on having overcome some challenges in 2023. Now we can get down to work. Now let's talk about public sector, the impact of political word on open source we are kind of seeing the emergence of techno-nationalism. Of course, we uh, talked about things like CRA, but what I want to understand from you is that when we look at all these political changes, you know, public sector changes, regulations, what does it mean for the future of open source? Very thankfully, um, the, the challenges that we faced last year in 2023 around regulation specifically the Cyber Resilience Act um, and AI regulation and how it is being designed in different jurisdictions around the world have helped us make the case for open source and the benefits of open collaboration and um, openness as it relates to sustainable development of technology uh, and providing the world with the most robust uh, technologies because of of the process of having mass collaboration from all regions. Um, So this was, um, I think that the outcomes of the Cyber Resilience Act have set us up for success. It's provided a a great example, a great testing ground for how the open source community can come together 
and confront common challenges as they relate to regulation and really uh, make the case for why regulation needs to be responsible and it needs to be inclusive of all the stakeholders at the point of uh, the original drafting of a regulation, not at the point where it's in the approval phase. Uh, so we learned a lot in 2023. We learned how to collaborate better as a community. Um, that was illustrated in our coming together in Geneva for Open Source Congress. And I see more of that type of activity where we keep the conversations going. Uh, we keep our collaboration across open source foundations open and um, uh, engaging and, you know, have a shared will to cooperate on all of these challenges. So I think we've set ourselves up um, to go forward in a very productive way. Now just look at the opposite side of the aisle of public sector, private sector. Of course, open source has kind of become a preferred model of software development, but are there still industries which are yet to fully or at all embrace open source? And do you see them starting to adopt open source, which would further feed their growth? Excellent question. We see tremendous opportunities for more collaboration in certain industries. And I'll give you two examples, one being healthcare and the other being in manufacturing. Um, Let's focus on manufacturing for a moment because um, we have all seen the news about Boeing's uh, 737 aircraft. And there is a deep need for greater trust um, at both the manufacturing level for um, equipment like aircraft uh, or equipment like healthcare, uh, medical equipment, and maintenance and safety records to be more transparent. Uh, we need greater traceability in our parts and our service. Um, there's a, an incredible role for uh, digital uh, trust to, to improve uh, healthcare and manufacturing. Uh, digital supply chains, 3D printing, where, where parts um, and the provenance of those parts are, are certified. Um, and so I think crises in industry often creates change and it increases collaboration because there's a need. There may be a mandate um, from a government to improve processes and improve um, transparency, or there is a mandate that comes by way of digital transformation, that the competitive environment is so acute that industries have to rethink how they organize themselves. And so I think healthcare and manufacturing for different reasons can benefit from greater open source collaboration. You mentioned AI and last year at the Open Source Summit in Bilbao, Spain, the Lynx Foundation, you folks announced some projects around generative AI as well. But when we look at generative AI, of course, there is software side, there is model side, but a new kind of challenge is emerging, which is around copyright and content. Some publishers are suing uh, the companies now uh, because they are not comfortable with them accessing their content. What role do you see foundation and especially Lynx Foundation they play to tackle some of these challenges that we are seeing in terms of generative AI? The New York Times uh, case is uh, on everybody's minds as a challenge uh, that relates to generative AI and our, our, our uh, appropriate use of technology and not infringing on, on copyright, whether it's uh, licenses or uh, intellectual property. Um, one of the exciting um projects that we host at the Linux Foundation that is helping to solve for this type of scenario is um, particularly relevant in 2024 because it is an election year in both the United States and in November, the European Parliament um, in June, and um, the need to have um, authentic uh, content is extremely important. The ability to um, certify the provenance of um, 
political content, of campaign content, and so much is being manipulated to um, undermine adversaries. Uh, we're, we have a, a new technology, a standard um, that is from the content, uh, beg your pardon, the Coalition uh, for Content Provenance and Authenticity. Uh, this is a set of standards that allows users and creators to have greater certainty around the provenance of content from different media. And that will create trust in, in, in generative AI, in um, content that we're viewing online. And uh, we're seeing manufacturers come to terms with this need and embed uh, these types of, of capabilities. Uh, certainly camera equipment manufacturers are allowing uh, for the origins and traceability of, uh, of imagery. We're seeing it rolled out by Sony, by Canon, um, and by Nikon. And foundations need to uh, come together uh, once again uh, to ensure that our communities are upholding uh, the highest possible uh, standards when it comes to not infringing on copyright, using uh, tools uh, to overcome this challenge um, encouraging their proliferation uh, and so on. So it is such an important topic. Uh, there's a lot of work that we have to do um, to ensure that uh, great technologies are not undermined by uh, bad practices. Now let's talk about another ecosystem or market, which is interesting because suddenly you'll see a spike in interest and then there will be dull moments, a spike in interest and dull moments. I'm talking about crypto and digital currency. You folks have some projects there last year. You've also, uh, I think last last year, you folks also announced Open Wallet. Time passes by so quickly. So, so a lot of pieces are already there when it comes to crypto and digital currency. Talk a bit about cryptocurrency, digital currency, and open source. The headlines are talking about Bitcoin uh, ETFs. The price of Bitcoin is up over 40,000 US dollars. It has not disappeared. It's overcome, the, the whole blockchain industry has overcome um, a pretty tumultuous time with um, the demise of FTX, uh, Sam Bankman Freed's uh, fraud, and so on. However, uh, what um, remains true is that digital assets and digital currencies are here to stay. And we are going to see more activity in 2024 as it relates to the world of digital assets um, and, and uh, open source. And the Linux Foundation is excited about our role in sustaining these communities. Um, late in 2023, we announced the intent to form uh, a new initiative with Circle, uh, a payments company, and uh, Block, a uh, Jack Dorsey's fintech company, um, Block's TBD, in fact, uh, to accelerate standards for open payments. So that's really exciting. Uh, uh, open payment standards, um, uh, digital credentials standards, and uh, decentralized IDs. These two are digital assets. Um, they have value, perhaps not monetary value, but a tremendous intrinsic value and value as it relates to our ability to transact. And so um, these types of developments are, are playing to a need in the world, particularly as it relates to 1.7 billion people who remain unbanked and who are not part of our global financial system. Yet, because they have a mobile phone, they have opportunities to transact in a digital economy. They may well be able to have access to um, central bank digital currency eventually without a bank account, or other types of stable coins like um, USDC, which is created by Circle. Uh, so digital uh, currency, um, stable coins, and yes, perhaps even um, Bitcoin and uh, other other tokens from from public blockchains are going to uh, remain in the headlines throughout 2024. And the Bitcoin ETF um, developments have 
reignited uh, those conversations about digital assets in the modern economy. And now let's talk about security. Thankfully, we have actually moved away from scaremongering and security as an afterthought or someone else's problem to it being a priority. We talk about the whole shift left movement. How do you see open source empowering security practitioners? Of course, you folks have projects like or foundations like Open Source Security Foundation. So, so let's look at security from the lens of open source. I see it uh, remaining one of the most important focuses for the Linux Foundation, for the Open Source Security Foundation, obviously. Um, and I see tremendous opportunities for impact. Um, we are continuing to collaborate uh, with as many parties as we can uh, work with because of our belief that security is a shared responsibility. And so opening dialogue with organizations to make sure that uh, they have every opportunity to embrace the tools, uh, the practices, um, and, and uh, support the programming that is making advancements in security. At Linux Foundation Research, we're continuing to publish um, new reports to identify uh, what is the most important software? What is the most widely used software at the application layer as a means to help secure that software? So uh, we're continuing to work with Harvard a Laboratory of Innovation Science on Census 3, where through a number of uh, uh, data set partners, we're looking at um, software composition analysis firms, what their, what their uh, data sets are revealing. Uh, we'll conduct subsequent research to determine who is maintaining um, those repositories, what resources do they need, all as a means to help secure um, uh, software supply chains. Uh, we're also conducting research in terms of um, cyber education. Where are the opportunities to accelerate um, learning about cybersecurity practices um, improving uh, software development um, for learners so that uh, at the earliest levels, uh, software developers are learning to build secure by default and not secure as an, as an aftermath um, or as an afterthought. Um, where are the, where is the programming weakest? Uh, how can we do more to ensure that our learners across all channels have the best possible opportunity to uh, think differently about software security. So it's it's a multi-pronged approach um, that we, we were very strongly committed to, that we're um, uh, engaging with regulators, their meetings taking place in Washington, as many as many opportunities to engage in Europe as possible uh, to, to collaborate on cybersecurity. We'll be there. Now, before we wrap this up, I want to ask you, what is going to be the focus of Linux Foundation in 2024? For 2024, we at the Linux Foundation are absolutely committed to con continuing to work with our developer communities and uh, to providing developers with um, the best possible resources, uh, tooling, best practices, uh, support, events, um, educational resources, uh, to keep them engaged, uh, to keep their um, participation high, and uh, work with our developers. They are the they they are the life of our organization. Um, and whatever we can do to nurture uh, developer ecosystems uh, is is where we'll be focusing much of our efforts. We'll be seeing our. Um, you'll be seeing many Linux Foundation team members at FOSDEM. Uh, in, in Brussels um, at the beginning of February. Uh, I'm speaking uh, at, at FOSTEM, so that's exciting. Um, hosting events uh, as we do uh, to engage developers and also doing more research, um, looking at the role of in-person events uh, and what how significant that role is on the developer's learning journey. It's very challenging for developers to come together in open source. We are a global community. We need resources to come together and build those bridges and build those networks. And events are a mechanism where we can do that. So doubling down on our commitment to hosting the best possible events 
to engage developers, provide them with the best possible tools, the best possible research. Uh, that's what we're really focused on this year. Hilary, thank you so much for taking time out today and share these great insights. And as usual, I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Swap. It's, it's been great to be back.